Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Kaufman Museum, Sunday afternoon at the museum. My name is John Fast, and we're glad you're here. For those of you who might be wondering, now I understand there might be another event happening later today. <laughs> I have made a request for them to hold off and to kick off until our event is done, and I have no doubt that they will honor that. <laughs> Seriously, though, it's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Lorna Hubbaker Harder. Um, I'm going to share some things with you that that's on her bio, but I'm going to also share with you some things I've learned about Lorna in the short time I've gotten a chance to work with folks. She was a biology teacher at Bethel, she worked with Dwight uh, Platt, Wayne Weems, and then went off to teach elementary school at St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, came back, was a natural curator for, curator for the museum, and then also taught biology for Heston College. As a former educator, and I'm going to immediately correct myself, there is no such thing as a former educator. Once an educator, always an educator. And as a retired educator, I'll clarify that, I've admired Lorna's passion for what she does. Um, while I've been with the museum, I've seen her teach with preschoolers, little kindergartners, and she connects so well with them, and shares her passion and love for nature in the prairie with them. I've seen her teach, and I've seen her work with adults, and she connects so well with everyone. And I think no doubt in talking to her, I understand that her love and her passion, she gets rejuvenated in her prairie and walking in her prairie and being in nature. And I have always learned something every time I have an opportunity to listen to Lorna. So we have an opportunity this afternoon. We're glad that she's here to speak to us. And I'm glad you're here as well. So would you please welcome Lorna Habaker Harder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here, and it's lovely to see some um, familiar faces and new faces as well. So glad you could be here this afternoon. I promise to end before kick-off kick off turning. <laughs> I will also um, uh, confess that this is not a great warm-up, perhaps for the Super Bowl, but it's something that's near and dear to my heart, so we'll go on. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about this event coming, but without further ado, we'll start with sister scientists, birders, and friends. Uh, in 2007, Dwight Platt gave this wonderful program about the Ruth sisters here at the museum. Um, and we were introduced to the story of these three extraordinary women who birded with passion in the mid uh, 20th century Kansas. But the birding story doesn't end with them. It continues with this ever widening circle of people that has been that were influenced with birding with the Ruth sisters, and Dwight Clapp was one of those people. So today, I want to tell you we'll re revisit the story of the Ruth sisters. I also want to um, integrate Dwight's story with that and today's story with their legacy. The, uh, the Ruth sisters and Ruth Rose, who was their weeks. So, um, years ago, when I was a student at Bethel College, it's, I used to study in the environmental science um, library just outside Dwight's office. And one day, for whatever reason, we were visiting, and I was introduced to the Ruth sisters' birding diaries in a corner shelf of his office. And I pulled one out, and I just started glancing through it, and I was, I have to say, I was rather enchanted by what I found there. It was just absolutely amazing what was written in those diaries. Okay. Fast forward, um, Dwight moved out of his office when he retired from Bethel College, and last spring when we were starting to work on this exhibit, um, I knew about those diaries, and I thought, oh my gosh, we have to have those as uh, for some of the research for this exhibit, and we couldn't find them. And then one day, the exhibit team went over to Dwight's emeritus office. Um, it got unlocked, and we went searching, and there in a box on the floor were all of the diaries, and they are now in the MLA. But for many, many years, Dwight had those um, saved and secure in his office, and we're ever so 
glad to have them. This is just one example. So I thought it would be fun to think about what happened 70 years ago today for the Ruth sisters. February 11, 1954. It was windy, clear, and cooler. And on the left-hand side of the two lists, you see what they saw in their yard. A male cardinal, a female red-bellied woodpecker, a chickadee, a male hairy woodpecker, a female downy woodpecker, and starlings. On the right-hand side, you see that Edna and two other individuals, J.H. and W.C., don't know who they are, saw, and you can see their list as well. They went from 3 to 4.45 p.m. And down at the bottom, we'll notice that Alma was not ill. She was in bed all day. She had had no breakfast, and she had a temperature. Such were the days in the diaries. Um, the Ruth sisters lived in this house in, um, or I should say, moved to this house when they were 20 and 30-somethings in 1917. It still stands. It's at 2nd and Poplar in Halstead. Um, in 1924, a niece, a new, uh, who had been recently divorced, moved from California with her infant son, Robert, um, and joined the household. Uh, tragically, Robert died as a 10-year-old from appendicitis. Um, and that was when I talked to Ruth A.V. White, a grandniece about it, she said it was heartbreaking to the household. Nonetheless, um, the sisters lived in this house for the remainder of their lives. They were interesting, they were extraordinary, perhaps eccentric in some ways. Um, they were lifelong learners. Um, I love these expressions. Ruth Rose on the left, Edna in the middle, and Alma on the right. Um, Ruth Rose was secretary to Dr. Arthur Hertzler of the Hertzler Clinic in um, Halstead. Edna was a milliner. Look at that hat. And Alma um, uh, was was the homemaker in that household and did a lot a lot of work. She was a gardener and bird. She birded along with the, the other two. So, these were the ladies, and they loved literature and poetry. Um, Edna sometimes would memorize poetry when she was ironing, and then she would recite the poems in the boat when they were rowing down to Little Arkansas in Halstead. And this is a book, also from Ruth A.V. White, of the Shakespeare Complete. And in it are all of his plays in, I'm going to say, minuscule typeset. And it's all annotated. So this was another one of the books that was on a regular read on their shelves. And then there was music. The Ruth family is known for music. Okay. Um, Alma played the organ for 36 years. Ruth Rose plays the piano, the cello, and the flute. And Edna took up the violin in her 20s, and then she went on to give lessons. But the thing that, for me, is outstanding is the operas. Again, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ruth A.V. White, who, as a child, remembers going over on Saturdays for Saturday afternoon at the opera with the Metropolitan Opera. They sat in the parlor quite attentively and quietly. And during, um, between acts and during intermissions, um, Edna would talk about, explain the opera in detail. This book is called, let me get to it, The Victrola Book of the Opera, copyright 1929. It was given to um, Ruth Rose by Edna and Alma in 1935. But what I find most interesting is this page. These are, this is one of three pages at the very opening of this book. By date and name are all of the operas that they listened to. So how did birding begin for these sisters? Well, nobody knows, as Dwight so aptly put it, nobody knows how they got the birding bug. However, they were avid and excellent gardeners. They spent a lot of time outdoors from childhood on. And um, here we have them in their backyard in Halstead with family and friends. But presumably, this was one of the reasons for them to becoming birders. 
Um, I read in some of Edna's um, notes that it was difficult to de decide or determine what the birds were to identify them initially. But they got binoculars and they got some field guides and then they were on their way to becoming the expert birders um, that, that they would be. Beginning in 1942, they started recording their daily observations. There are 10 years of calendars like this, of what they saw in the yard every day. Um, Edna wrote, in 1942, we drifted into jotting down on the calendar in the kitchen whatever birds were seen day by day, sometimes also noting pertinent data. After reading books by Roger Torrey Peterson, James Hickey, etc., and Audubon magazine, I feel the day-to-day -day calendar would be of some value as it would be the study of the same locality for that period. Well, so when, when you look at these calendars and you think, okay, how in the world do you get this information moved from calendars over to some form of um, listed listing. Ruth Rose did that. And so we have um, a 365 page scrapbook. And each page is devoted to a day of the year. And on each page is, there are 10 years worth of observations from those calendars. So those have all been transcribed. The diaries that followed are a little bit easier to read, and um, that information hopefully will be transcribed in the future. So how did they bird? Well, by boat and car. This is a, f for us here, this is a famous photograph of the ladies boating. This is um, Alma, Ruth Rose, Edna, and Marie, and I don't remember her last name. I was a kid in Halstead, and I knew these ladies, these names, and these ladies when I was a five-year-old, and I do remember them. And I remember Marie, but I don't remember her last name. I will just say that. Um, but they boated on the, on the Little Arkansas River that flows through um, Halstead, and they also um, birded in the field. Dwight was able to find 55 locations around Halstead where they frequently went to see the birds. Alma wrote about boat bird watching. To bird from a boat, four or five things are essential. A rowboat, <laughs> binoculars, a quiet, placid stream, a willingness to put aside the urge for speed and time, to count all the birds seen, Watching from the boat, birds do not greatly fear one, as sitting low, you quietly drift by. Doesn't that sound idyllic? And then in 1954, Edna was 65, and they bought a car named Topsy. And I found the day, whoops, sorry. Um, you see, Topsy is ours at the top of uh, October 14th, 1954. Well, the adventures began. Over the next several weeks, first of all, in this diary, I read about her learning to drive adventures. In one entry, she says, I went berserk backing up. I don't know what that means exactly, but in any case, lots of exclamation points, and it was underlined in red. So, <laughs> so there must have been some adventures, or there is a story that went with that. But once she got her um, driving competency, up, um, they went birding across 32 states. They logged 119,000 miles over 12 years. And along the way, they always took notebooks. And we have an abundance of records of those travels. Notes, adventures, birds, the whole the whole kit and caboodle. Um, and on these trips, they also networked with ornithologists. They networked 
with um, birders from across the nation and, and again, significant work done in terms of, of bird populations in North America. Edna was also a really wonderful writer. She published in the National Audubon Magazine, in um, Nature Magazine, and she also published frequently in the Kansas Ornithological Bulletin in local newspapers and so forth. Um, one year, there was a, a fairly uncommon visitor, the Townsend Solitaire, that arrived in Halstead, and for, I, approximately four or five months, they watched this bird, and it resulted in Singer in the Mountains, which was published in the Audubon magazine. Um, this is again an example of Edna's curiosity about birds. You can see the photograph of the, of the Townsend Solitaire. They're mostly in the Rocky Mountains. They have a beautiful song, and they sing while they fly. Um, but Edna was really interested in in the Townsend Solitaire, where it had been in Kansas, how many times it had been seen. And so there is a whole folder full of correspondence um, to birders across Kansas to find out more about where and when Townsend, Solitaire, uh, Townsend Solitaires had occurred. And this map is part of that study. Um, so she located where they had been um, and when they had been there and how many, and presented that to the Kansas Ornithological Society in about 1957, I believe. And so she would find these topics and, and that she was interested in, research them deeply, and um, report on them. There was another uncommon visitor in Halstead in 1951 and 52. This was the Inca dove. And they watched this bird for 72 days. They worried about it. They, they um, got, grew really attached to it. Um, it's a beautiful little dove. It has this bright crimson underwing, which this photograph shows. We don't see it usually when we see the bird, but when they lift their wing, that is what is underneath. They're really beautiful birds. Anyway, this resulted in the Inca princess with Wings, which was published in Nature magazine in 1952. Um, Edna Ruth passed away in 1968 on her 80th birthday. Alma and Ruth Rose both passed away in 1971. But all of them continued to follow the rhythms of the day and note their birds almost until the ends of their lives. So we have the birds that they saw within days of when they, when they died, really a tribute to their dedication to birding. Dwight Platt, here with us today. He was born in 1931, and this is just based on what I know of him. I think he must have been a quiet and studious and attentive child who enjoyed the outdoors, who gardened with his family, um, and who appreciated what he was seeing there. And then um, he chuckled. He told me about this last year when I was, was visiting with him about the exhibit. He said he received a special Christmas Day gift from his Aunt Emily. It was a subscription to the Junior Natural History magazine. And he just said, little did Aunt Emily know how she would change my life with that subscription. Um, when I asked him how he started birding, he said he doesn't exactly remember, but he says that the birds were always there for him to see. They were available wildlife every day. And he started paying closer attention to them because of that. Oh, and I should also note that Dwight's first published article appeared in this magazine when he was an elementary school te uh, child. It was about his favorite zoo animal, the monkey. <laughs> and I should also note that this is one of the first articles, or the, one of the first issues that he received. They are all secured 
in a box. We have them here for the moment. They will go back to his house again, but he kept them. So we have this wonderful history of the Junior Natural History Magazine and Dwight Platt. Um, scientist in the making. And so a childhood of birding. Dwight said that he became serious about birding, he thinks, more when he started going birding with Roy Henry. Some of you may remember that name. I certainly do as a child from my childhood. He was a well-known naturalist in our area. Um, and it was Roy Henry that introduced Dwight to the Ruth sisters. And that was a friendship that would last a lifetime. Um, and after they became acquainted with Dwight, if you follow the diaries, there are frequent mentions of going birding with Dwight on numerous occasions. Dwight's um, passion for the outdoors, for birds, led him to um, graduate studies after Bethel College. Um, this is one of our favorite stories. It comes from Zona, his sister. And the photo does as well. Here is Dwight with Corky, their pet crow. Um, as the story goes, uh, there were, they lived on a farm, and there was a barn where crows roosted. And sometimes farmers would be annoyed with the crows who um, were eating crops, and they would come and they would shoot them. Well, Corky was found um, an orphan, and so they brought, an, uh, it was an orphan nestling actually, so they brought him home and he became the pet of the family. When I asked Dwight today how long he, they had Corky, he says, I don't remember exactly. And apparently this crow didn't talk, but crows are known for their sociality and their intelligence and their ability to mimic human speech as well. And they do make great pets, in case you're interested. Um, Dwight also, when those crows were shot, he would also sometimes take crow carcasses and dissect them to learn more about the birds. The book on the right, Food of the Crow, Corvus Brachyrancos Brem in South Central Kansas was written by Dwight. That was part of his graduate work at uh, University of Kansas. And interestingly enough, in 2022, Alpha Editions has republished this book because of its importance to um, current and future generations. So it's still available. And now that brings me to the Halstead Newton Christmas bird count. In the winter of 1949, um, I, when I was a sophomore at Bethel College, three of us heard about the CBC, the Christmas bird count. I'll be talking about CBC, and I am referring to the Christmas bird count. And he decided to do one in Harvey County, Jim Rich, Roy Henry, and I. We went five miles north along Sand Creek, east to Spencer Road, and back south along hedgerows and field. Nine hours in the field, and we recorded 983 species, I'm sorry, 983 individuals of 28 species. One additional count was held in 1950 for the Newton count um, before it was disbanded when Dwight went on to graduate school. In 1950, Edna Ruth also started a bird count, the Halstead Christmas bird count. She and a friend spent December 30, 1950, mainly along the Emma Creek, counting 1,296 birds from 30 species. The Halstead CBC continued with Edna Ruth for the next um, uh, about 20 years. They stayed within a 15-mile radius circle centered west of Halstead. Participants still remember compiling the day's observations over tea and cookies in the Ruth sisters' parlor at the end of every count day. Compilation involves creating a list of the species that are seen, the numbers of individual birds that are seen, the hours spent in the field by each individual birder, the miles traveled on foot, the time traveled on foot, the miles traveled in a car or a vehicle, 
the miles traveled in a vehicle, and the weather conditions. That information all was manually typed up by Edna Ruth and then mailed to the National Audubon Society and added to their Christmas bird count records. The records that you see here, I simply went online to the historic records and downloaded them, as easy as that. I'll talk a little more about that in just a minute or so here. The history of the Halstead-Newton Christmas bird count is pretty interesting. In 1958, when Dwight returned from school to become part of the faculty at Bethel College, he wanted to restart the Newton Christmas bird count. Then he visited with Edna Ruth, and they decided to merge the two counts. The count circle designated by Edna Ruth was moved a few miles east to include most of Newton, and Newton area birders and Halstead birders joined forces to, um, to um, become part of the Halstead-Newton Christmas bird count. In 1965, the newly designated Sand Prairie Reserve, Natural History Preserve, was added to the circle and its CBC Circle Center was again moved, this time several miles north to include the reserve. That is this circle and that remains to this day. In 1966, Edna Ruth handed, um, her health was failing and she was getting older, and so she handed leadership of the Halstead Newton Christmas Bird Count to Dwight Platt, who continued in that role for nearly 40 years. His scientific analyses of local CBC data during those years promoted greater understanding of birds and bird populations in Kansas. And as one Kansas ornitholog ornithologist told me recently, Dwight's analysis set a gold, new gold standard for analyzing Christmas bird count data in the state of Kansas. Here are two examples of his work, and I have folderfuls of his work in this regard. But just to show you how detailed it is, on the left is a graph um, showing starlings and house sparrows populations across um, the years. I think this was from 49 to 77, so about 50 years. 40 years, I guess. And below are water birds and flocking non-water birds, and again, populations. On the right is the first page of the list of all of the species seen um, for the, Chris the Halstead Newton Christmas bird count. So again, records kept, analyses performed, and um, data maintained for future generations. Now, of course, graphs, I mean, these graphs were made by hand, and they're meticulous, and they're beautiful. Um, now, of course, we just generate them on computer. But this shows the care that was taken in maintaining the Christmas bird count data over the years. Now, let me go back one yet here. Um, the value of the Christmas bird count can't be understated. Um, today we have perhaps three billion birds less than we did 50 years ago. Bird populations are in decline. And one of the reasons we know that is because we have Christmas bird count data. Um, that has been telling us a lot about the state of our birds. And so when we think about, about um, the people, the community, the citizens who are involved with this, and the work that they are doing, this is really providing a snapshot for the birds in our local areas. To put this in perspective today, well, as of 2022, which was the latest data available, there are 2,600 plus bird count circles in North America, I'm sorry, Canada, the United States, the Caribbean, Latin America, and the Pacific Islands. And in 2022, 76,880 citizens reported 42,000, I'm sorry, 42 million 876,395 individual birds from 2,554 species. That's the reach of the Christmas bird count today. It's important. All of those Ruth records that you saw earlier have all been entered in databases now and are available also. And they again form the base of us, our understanding of, of how populations are changing um, 
with our times. On last, our last Christmas bird count, um, Dwight didn't participate. He didn't in the field in 2023, December 2023. He did, however, rise early and he sent us off. He was here at 7 a.m. with the rest of the birders and he was here again to welcome us back at 5 p.m. During the day, he carved out some time to watch his bird feeders instead and submitted his list of observations for the count. His observations were also part of his 20-year involvement with Project Feeder Watch, which you see in the lower right-hand corner here. Um, he has been watching his, during the winter, he has been watching his feeder, um, recording the birds that he sees and the numbers, and submitting these. And this is another snapshot. This is community science in action. This is another snapshot of the birds that are uh, um, seen in places all across North America and beyond. Again, data that helps us understand more about what and where and who is there. Um, these are just some of the organizations. eBird is an online application and when we go birding now, we still use pencil and paper to record, but eBird takes a lot of the the burden off in terms of keeping time. It keeps track of the birds we see. It keeps track of the time that we spend on foot and the mileage. It keeps track of the miles we spend in the car and the mileage. And it keeps track of the birds we see. So it's really a valuable assist to our birding these days in the field. Um, there's a North American breeding survey. Dwight was involved with that. I still am, and we go out and look for breeding birds in June on a day. Latino Outdoors, birding is becoming much more inclusive. Latino Outdoors is an organization that encourages birding amongst Latino youth. Um, there are the Black Birders, and that is another organization that is encouraging African American people to go out and bird. Birdability is about um, birding with those who have some kind of physical disability, um, from, from sight and hearing impairments to mobility impairments. Um, there is a feminist bird club available for girls. And Project Feeder Watch, Merlin in the center there is an, a bird ID, it's an app. And then there is the Great Backyard Bird Count that also occurs in spring. Lots of opportunities for citizens to, to participate in birding at whatever level and however much time they want to spend and making contributions in the process. So important. Being a good ancestor. No other sport or hobby does so much to preserve the very creatures which provide that sport, nor does any other hobby make contribution to science as does bird watching. For from the counts are established distribution of individual species and increase and decline of bird populations, and much is learned of the ecology of the subject. Were less guns bought for youngsters and more sports glasses, more would be contributed to the survival of man in the final battles between the insect world and mankind than all the sprays or guns could achieve. This was Ruth, Edna Ruth. She and a friend had been out on the Christmas bird count in 1951, and I believe the editor of the Halstead Independent had met them and asked what in the world they were doing, and they told him, and he said, well, I want an article. And so this was part of the article that she wrote about that Christmas bird count. She proceeded to write a re, um, an account of every Christmas count they had for the next 20 or so years, and they all appeared in the um, Halstead Independent. So it was at the beginning of her, her um, articles in the newspaper. Being a good ancestor, though, for me is, um, well, let me just say it this way. For me, birding encapsulates so much more than just the science. Um, it's the friendships, the mentorships, the learning, the sharing of knowledge, the passion for birds that we share, being outdoors, 
the opportunities to contribute to science, all of this and so much more make it such a joy and a pleasure. And also, it feels like I can make contributions, that it isn't just for me. It's for something bigger than who I am or what I am doing. And I love that. I'm also aware of my responsibility to pass it along to new generations, just as Dwight Platt and the Ruth sisters and Ruth Rose have done. I'm really grateful to them and to the hosts of birders across the continent, across the years, who have and continue to do exactly that. These are the folks who have made this exhibit possible, who have made this, this program possible. Um, I should also add the MLA, who has been so gracious in providing a lot of documents to me along the, uh, along the way. Um, with that, I will close. I will entertain questions, and then I think John has some announcements. We have a roving mic, and so I, if you have a question, I'll bring the mic to you. Double checking. I'll come to the very back. I don't know if eBird accepts uh, older data, but like with historical records like this, mm -hmm. you, what are the possibilities of being the a able to add all this years yeah, of data into yeah. the into eBird uh, database? Yeah, what are the possibilities of entering old data into eBird? It's happening. Uh, Stan Center, who is going to be presenting here in May with the exhibit, um, has been very interested in the Ruth sisters records. A short story on that, Stan Center was an eighth grader when he first participated in the Christmas bird, the Halstead Newton Christmas bird count back in the 60s, I believe. There's a funny story about that. Um, but he went on to become uh, a science coordinator for National Audubon Society, newly retired now, and he's been helping us with the exhibit. Um, but he has been very, very interested in, in getting the records of the Ruth sisters and entering those into the eBird database. And yes, that is happening. As, as historic records are verified, they're accepted um, for entry into that database. Good question. Other questions? I do have a couple of questions for you. How many of you were familiar with Roy Henry? Anybody? Mm -hmm. And I should also recognize Bob uh, Regeer, who was a major part of the Halstead Newton Christmas bird count for so many years. Dwight said he was one of the stalwarts of the Christmas bird count. And it's nice to see you here today. Um, how many of you are birders or do some birding? And you know what? Birding is, if you look out the window and see birds and say, oh, that's birding. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? On my way. So what were the years that the Ruth sisters were birding, and did they have a profession? Did they work outside of yeah. their, their bird? Okay, yeah. So Alma was at home, and um, Edna Ruth was a milliner, and so she, she worked in a hat shop in Halstead. And Ruth Rose worked in, as a, a personal secretary to Dr. Arthur Hertzler of the Hertzler Clinic in Halstead. So Edna and Ruth Rose worked outside of the home, and then the rest of the time they were home and they <laughs> Birded. Yeah. I would assume because of I would assume because of this audience that most of you are aware of the eBird app that you can identify birds with. If you don't, you should definitely download that because it's such a delight when you're out walking and you can hit that button and find out what bird and look for the bird. It's just wonderful. Yeah. The apps that are available for birding are amazing these days. eBird is 
they're free, downloadable. Um, and eBird is connected to Merlin. And so you can identify by this, the song of the bird, by the appearance through um, photographs, multiple photographs. So it's made it a lot easier to get correct identifications. You can download photographs. You can take pictures, download photographs also. Last spring, I was birding in my pasture, and I heard a western flycatcher. No, a western Phoebe, sorry. And I heard it at first, and I thought, what is that doing here? Because normally I hear it when I'm hiking in the Rocky Mountains in summertime. And so I recorded the song, and I uploaded it to eBird, and I declared, yes, it was a western Phoebe that I had heard. And I got an email back because all of those records, there are, there are checkers on all of the eBird apps. And um, Chuck Adi got back to me and said, are you sure? And I said, well, listen to the recording. See what you think. And it was verified. So there are ways to verify the birds that you're seeing and hearing um, so that you, can, you do have good identification of the birds. Do you have a manuscript of what you just shared with us? I do. <laughs> well, is it available? <laughs> I can make it so, yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Just to clarify, she will make the manuscript available from today. Thank you. Yes. And John, you can also say that you will, you're recording the program and it will be available. This program is also record, recorded and available online, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. One more. My father learned birds from the Rose Sisters and Ruth Rose in particular. I went on a couple of those Christmas bird counts with him, froze my feet off. Um, that's what I remember. He had some old record albums that I believe he borrowed from them that were bird calls so he could learn them. Are those anywhere in anybody's possession? I remember listening to them. <laughs> Can I ask what your name is? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Darlene Powers. My father was Roy Arnheimer. I wondered. From Halstead. Bec yeah, because your parents were Roy and Rosie and they used to, you all, your family used to come visit my family. Your father. Okay, there you go. All right. It goes on, doesn't it? Anyway, I wondered. Yeah, and, and actually, when I first started with the Halstead Newton Count, your dad was still involved with it. I remember that. In terms of the recordings, I don't know, but you know what? We'll do some looking. It's an interesting question. What, what is the most... Uh, the greatest change or dramatic difference, uh, what type of bird during this history of this bird count? Oh, what is the most dramatic change? Hmm. Of a certain bird type? Yeah, okay. So we talk about this. Um, I did some of the research for the exhibit. And one of the things we noted that some of the birds that were really quite common in the 50s and 60s are less common now. One of those is the meadowlark. Um, that's, um, I should say that grassland bird species are ex experiencing the steepest declines of any ecosystem in, in North America, beyond the forests or any, anything else. And so, the meadowlark is just one of those um, that is in decline. And the trends are downward for that one, both eastern and western. Populations have changed. There are more blue jays now than there used to be. Um, because, again, I'm not, I'm not saying this is why, but we do think that because winters are warmer, um, those populations are able to persist here for longer periods of time or all winter instead of sinking more to the south. And that goes along with a lot of other birds. With the encroachment of trees into our prairies, we have fewer grassland species and we have more woodland species um, like woodpeckers and chickadees and nuthatches and some of the common birds that we see in our yards and gardens these days. 
Cardinals would be another one. I can't point to one exact bird, but there are changes. The other thing that, that we talk about most every year, and it's just anecdotal, and that is that we just see fewer birds. We still are seeing 60 to 70 species routinely, and that's, I mean, it can fluctuate a little bit, but that, that is our range. But we're seeing fewer birds of, of the birds we're seeing, of the species we're seeing. The numbers are down. Um, and we do notice that. Um, one of my favorite birds, my spark bird, is the Harris Sparrow. And in my yard, I used to have dozens. And now, not so much. I mean, I'm noticing how there are fewer. And when I looked at those numbers, and that's in the exhibit, they're down for our wintering populations. They are simply down. I don't know if that answered your question, but that tells you a little bit about the trends that we're seeing. For several years recently, we had bluebirds in our yard in January. In the last two years, we haven't seen them. Uh, is that a, a trend? There was a reason for that. Um, yeah, I had them in my yard until two years ago, uh, and we got a few back this year. Um, about, what is it, two years ago in February, we had an extreme cold snap. And though bluebirds, eastern bluebirds, require, they, they have an insect diet, and they simply did not have food. It was, the ground was covered with snow, it was desperately cold, and a lot of them perished around here. And so um, those numbers are slowly returning, but that's the reason it crashed around, and the population crashed around here. And you know, there was a, that was a huge cold snap that went way, way far south. So bird populations definitely suffered during that um, because they were not accustomed to that extreme cold. Other questions in back? What are things that we can do at our level or at a societal level to help protect our natural birds? Lots. <laughs> what can we do? OK. The thing I tell everyone right away is build a national park in your backyard. Um, when I say that, I mean make it friendly for wildlife. If we can make friendly, I say bird-friendly habitat, reduce the spraying, let it be a little messy sometimes, that's fine. Um, let the insects grow, um, let the insects be. Um, cultivate a garden that welcomes wildlife in. That's one of the big things. Use native plants, I could go on about that, I won't here. But um, I think that's one thing you can do. If you don't have a backyard, if you have a balcony, if you have a postage size stamp piece of ground, make it worth it for a bird to visit it. That's all I can say. Um, if you're interested in community science, go birding, learn to know the birds. When you learn to know the birds, you care more about birds, I think. If you learn to know the names of plants and animals around you, you care more about them. And that can go a long way. Policy is a moral multiplier. If you have interest in, in working with, with the policies in your community, get involved see what you can do to make some changes. Habitat loss is one of the critical drivers of losses of birds. Another, um, another driver of loss is loss of insects. Our insect populations have also gone down dramatically in the last 20 years, and that's bird food. Lorna, could I segue to this to something that sure. would fit in nicely, and that would be mentioning March 2nd mm -hmm. commemorations. Would you care to, uh, to address this? Yes. Sure? I'm I would. sure you would be happy to. Go ahead. <laughs> OK. So on March 2nd of this year, we're going to have a half-day spring symposium at the Dick Arboretum. It's called Murmurations and Exaltations. Do you know what murmurations are? OK. Do you know what exaltations are? Of larks. I heard it. Yes. OK. Um, 
Birds and Birding in a Changing World. We have three speakers. We're going to start the morning open generally to the public of the first Saturday bird walk at the Arboretum this time with Greg Friesen. And then breakfast is going to be part of the uh, registration with the, the um, symposium. And then Chuck Otte will talk about the state of Kansas birds. Gene w Woods will speak on the study of skins and how that helps us understand birds. And Jackie Augustine, Dr. Jackie Augustine, will speak about um, are birders replacing hunters? Interesting question. If you walk around campus and here at our door and around town, you will find these posters here uh, promoting this event. Mm -hmm. And there's a website that, that I think I can actually, let me just, there it is. And so information and registration is listed at the bottom as well. Maybe most of you caught this, but uh, there was an excellent program last Wednesday, or this last Wednesday, Shorebird Flyways, and uh, Stan Center was mentioned, this is why I bring this up, that his son Nathan was a participant in that okay. program, and I think it's going to be repeated on 8.2 to this Monday night. That would be shorebird migrations, and that's on KPTS ch channel eight. And it's, it's a nature, um, so it'd be available on Passport as well. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that I'm in possession of hundreds of bird pictures that my brother Edward took, mostly in Minnesota. He has passed on now, and I'm supposed to dispose of them, and I hate to just throw them out. He wasn't a great photographer, but he has written on the edges of each slide what kind of bird it is and where he saw it. So if anybody's interested in, in slide pictures of birds, talk to me. And the Minnesota folks might be interested, Minnesota birding community might be interested in that as well. Something to check out. Other questions? Great, great questions have been asking. Would you join me in thanking Lorna for coming and sharing this afternoon? Thank you, Lorna. Thank you.